TOA community. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Robert Linkle. This is trainingtheolderadult.com. And I want to talk to you today <clears throat> about a question that I got. Well, actually, first of all, I want to, we just got done watching this, the deepest breath. Bring some tissues, number one. Really intriguing story. Very romantic, very passionate, very um, sporting, very championed. Like just anything and everything you look for in a story with a tragic ending that made me bawl my eyes out. Anyhow, um, great film. It deserves to be better than number eight on their top 10. So you want to cry but be inspired and watch something awesome and give that a watch. Uh, it's under deep breath holding, you know, that kind of stuff. It was very cool. Great documentary. Okay. So I got this. Um, has nothing to do with this. I just wanted to share with it. I got this text yesterday from my client, Ruth. And she said, a Robert question, why is it when I go on long walks and hikes three miles or more, my lower back gets really sore and stiff? So I sent her this little article and it, it covers just the basics of like, you know, why your lower back aches, et cetera. And I gave a four minute and 26 second answer back to her. In the last 30 seconds, I'm like, I think I should just do a video on this. It seems silly not to. So I'm trying to describe to her what the iliacus and the psoas muscle do as hip flexors when we walk, okay? So <clears throat> the reason why this is important to know is you have a muscular fatigue component that comes in when you're walking, when if you're carrying load or anything else, it's only accelerated, okay? So if you're capable right now of walking a mile, where your musculature is strong enough to hold you in perfect posture, you don't slouch, you don't tuck your butt, you don't over abuse any other musculatures, you're just capable of walking a mile out and a mile back, let's say, two miles total, you can do that and you're great. Nothing hurts, nothing aches, we're good. That means that your cardiovascular system is sound for what you, you attempted to do and that your musculature is capable of doing that amount of turnover at that pace with that load at that distance and coming back and there's no problem, okay? So then you decide, well, let's go for a three mile walk, okay? And in doing that, at a mile and a half out, your body is used to two miles, so you're a mile and a half out and now you turn around and you're coming back and once you pass the two mile marker, you are now into overload. It's something more than your body is, is used to doing. So you have four quadriceps, one that crosses the hip. That's your rectus femoris, okay? And it's a hip flexor. That muscle pulls at the top of the hip, it pulls your knee up, and it helps you with every step that you take. Now the other primary hip flexors are these two, the, ilius, the iliacus, which is this guy, okay? Divide it out a little bit, the, the more red one. Uh, or excuse me, that's your, yeah, that's iliacus. And then your psoas muscle, the green one, okay? Those two iliopsoas, they make up that muscle that wrap through the, go from the back, your spine, and they wrap through the front of your hip and come down over the top. So think of it like a puppet string, okay? Really good way I like to give an analogy. This is my Sunday attire, by the way. Uh, so it's originating back here. It goes through the front of your hip, okay, like a string. And if I were to pull on that string, it would pull my knee up, okay? Like that's my puppeteering abilities with my musculature. So as I'm walking now, beyond my two mile marker, my musculature is like, we're not, we're not conditioned for this. We're now in a muscular fatigued state. So these muscles are now getting abused, okay? Which isn't bad because if you continue to do this, they'll start to level up. That's a, a gradual overload and they'll start to get stronger and you'll be able to do this, okay? And this is a perfect overload progression, by the way. I don't want to get too deep or lost, but if you do two miles, two miles, two miles, and you do two miles for like two weeks, and then you decide to go to two and a half for two weeks, and then three miles for two weeks, your body will be fine. It's when you do two miles, two miles, two miles, seven miles, that's when your body's like, Bro, what did you just do to us? Like, this is double, more, way more than what we're used to, to doing. That's when injuries occur, muscles start to ache, etc., because now other musculatures have to try to kick in to help and the muscles that hold you in the proper postures, they can't anymore. They're so fatigued, you start to slouch, you start to tuck your butt, you start to take smaller steps, you start to wobble step, you start to do all these other little things where you're just like, I just gotta get back, okay? So that's why if you look at this and you're like, what muscles are pulling my legs through every time? It's these muscles, right? Along with the erectus femoris, and there's some others, but these are the, these are the big ones, okay? 
and the serratorius, the hip flexor, et cetera. Okay, there's some other ones. Um, and in, in looking at that, if you go, okay, if these guys are fatigued, where do they originate from? Well, they originate off of L3, 4, 5, you know, they originate off the lumbar. So if they start to fatigue and give out, what, what part of their bony um, body stature are they going to start to manipulate and, and fold because they're not strong enough to yank on it anymore? It's the lumbar. So you look at it and you're like, well, that's why my back starts to hurt. I start to overarch my back. I start to under tuck my butt. Start to do whatever you can because your muscles are fatiguing. They're failing. And now, okay, and something else has to kick in to help you get home. So if you do gradual progressions, just like I'd be in here doing shrugs with 60s, and then I go to 100, my neck's going to be sore, my traps are going to be sore, my grip is going to hurt. But if I do 60, 60, 60s, two weeks later, 65, 65, two weeks later, 70, 70, you do gradual progressions, your body will have this little overload, and it'll adapt and overload and adapt, and that's the said principle. It's a specific adaptation, slowly getting better, to an imposed demand. Specific adaptation, imposed demand, said, okay? So if you give gradual progressions to this, your body will do just fine, right? So when you, you think about that, what also plays into this? The amount of load that you put onto your body has a big deal to do with this question, okay? If you're going out walking, it's just your body weight, that's fine. If all of a sudden you start carrying a five pound canteen that, sl that slides over your left shoulder to your right hip, and you're always wearing it on that side, what do you think it's gonna do to the rest of your gait and your body mechanics, et cetera? It's gonna start to mess with it, right? You have five extra pounds over here and nothing on this side, and so you're gonna get this cross-sectional activation that's slowly gonna to start to wear, your muscles are gonna fatigue, and now you've got this shifting kink in your body. So now, instead of having just a sagittal forward issue, I now have a frontal plane issue that I'm having to deal with as well. Now we also walk contralaterally, which means my left foot forward with my right hand and right shoulder forward. And so you do the sexy catwalk, right? When you're going, that's not that much, but you get, you know, get what I'm saying? That now you start to put transverse planes. So now you've got all three planes of action, of motion going in there, but they're overloaded or unevenly loaded. So that's some, something as simple as, you know, a fanny pack on one side or aging myself with a fanny pack, but they're making a comeback, okay? Or a canteen or something like that. If you wear a kit, a backpack, a ruck, okay, that's fairly even down the middle, a little bit better, it's down, well, a lot better, it's down the center, but if it's 10 or 15 pounds, that's 10 pounds every step that you take. That means every 10 steps you take, that's an extra 100 pounds that you've put through your body. And if you take thousands of steps going out for a walk, that's tens of thousands of pounds you've now moved, right? We don't think about all those little add-ups. Let's go all the way down to the point of your gait and how long your gait should be if you wear a size 10, your foot from the back of the heel to the front of the toe, I've talked about this before, is 10 inches. There's one foot, 10 inches, okay? Your other foot in the step is 10 inches. You should have at least 10 inches between them. So that means from your back left heel to your front right toe should be 30 inches of distance, if not more like 32 to 33, because we would rather it be a little bit longer than just the three. But if it's like 37 or 38, you're overstriding, we can be just as much of a problem as understriding. So when you think like it's just walking, I'm not doing anything major. Well, why do you think foot mechanics are so important? Why do you think body mechanics are so important? Why do you think stature and posture and gait stride and load and from the shoes you wear to the time you go out to the sunblock to how well hydrated you are to all of this has to do it's physical performance yeah i'm not running i'm not sprinting i'm not deep diving you know to hundreds of feet i'm going out for a walk but there's still impact to be had there so there's very good value in all of this walking is a beautiful thing i love it i love clients that are going to go out and rock or go for walks and i think loading your body is great i had a gentleman that emailed me a couple of months ago and he said, um, I want you to work with me. I want you to teach me how to ruck and introduce a rucking program. And I said, um, a rucking program, you and your rucking programs. Uh, <laughs> and, and I said, I'd be happy to do that, but are you currently working with someone? He said, yes. And I said, why don't you talk to that trainer about implementing a rucking program? And they said that, um, he said that his trainer believed that because he had osteoporosis, he was going to get a compound fracture if he went out walking with weight. Granted, asking what this trainer had him doing in the weight room, 
Um, he said, you know, I do leg press, I do squats, I do sit to stands, I do step ups, I walk on a treadmill, I walk uphill, I pull a sled, I put all these things that put way more pressure through your body, through your frame than walking with 10 pounds in a backpack will ever do. Okay. They're doing in the weight room, but this particular trainer believes going out and walking right with 10 pounds in a backpack will create a compound fracture or fracture of, you know, the bonies, the, the, the bony musculatures in your body. And that is not true. Okay. Anything can happen. A freak accident can happen, but that could happen in the weight room. That, this can happen anywhere. You have osteoporosis, you have brittle bones, right? But with progradual, with progradual, with gradual progressive resistance, maybe I can make up a new word. Um, any, if you, as long as you progress this correctly, you'll make the, the appropriate progressions without injury, fingers crossed, you know? It just seems silly to make a blanket statement like that to me, like, oh, well, any resistance training will end in an injury. No, it won't. Walking's gonna result in a compound fracture. No, it won't. It will not, okay? Show me evidence that says that. You could be the highest level of bone, you could be Mr. Glass from Unbreakable, you could be Samuel L. Jackson, okay? Dudes walking around in a leather trench coat in the summer, by the way. Anybody notice that? That had to be three or four pounds of extra load on him, and he was okay until he fell down a flight of stairs. And that dude's made of glass. So <laughs> taking an extreme Superman villain role, my point is, is if you have bones that can hold your body upright under gravitational pull, I think going out for a walk, you'll be okay. But if you put 60 pounds on your back and go outside and go running, yeah, you're probably going to fracture something, right? As with anything, from water consumption that we've seen to anything else, if you take in too much, you can hurt yourself. If you do too much, you can hurt yourself. Don't make blanket statements like that. I find that to be rather ridiculous, okay? All right, so let's look at an article uh, that I, this is one of the couple that I sent. I, well, I sent one to Ruth, but one of the few that I'm referencing in the video that I think are pretty beneficial. This one's how to stop walking, how to stop back pain when walking. They really kind of focus on you know, understand the importance of back pain. And they're like, what we're really talking about is sciatica. Not necessarily. You can just have QL, quadratus laborum, and erector muscles that go up your spine. You can just have weakness in those muscles and they just ache when you walk. It doesn't mean you have sciatica, okay? Sciatica is pretty common in people that their back hurts when they walk, but it doesn't, just because your lower back's aching doesn't mean you have sciatica, okay? Um, sciatic pain comes from vertical compression of, of discs that eventually either start to push out, okay? They start to herniate, they start to bulge, and then eventually they can rupture. And if they rupture, you're screwed. You, you have to have surgery to fix it. Once ruptured, nothing's putting the crab meat back in the crab pocket, as my surgeon told me. But if it starts to bulge, you can do certain things where you start to do traction and start to float and start to do anti-inflammatory, whatever, whatever things you can do that, that are specific to you that will help in relaxing that disc and allow things to kind of come back to where they normally were and then proper resistance training without a lot of vertical compression jumping bounding skipping heavy squats that kind of thing you can live on right as i did for many years before needing surgery to the point once mine ruptured it was lights out nothing was fixing that pain sciatic pain all the way down my leg tingling in my toes standing seat seated anywhere i was uncomfortable like once that's popped, it's, you can't put it back together. You have to have surgeries, okay? Um, very, very, very few, very rare people have had ruptures of a disc and been able to tolerate and live. It depends on which direction it ruptures and et cetera, but we're talking one out of every 10,000 people, something like that, okay? Learning to walk with proper posture, we talked about that. A, a three, stri three of your foot lengths is an ideal gait and learning to walk, not over sexy with the hips, but just enough where you're getting a, you know, a gradual stride, allowing your hips to work and not just hip flexing the whole thing with the front, like flutter kicking with, you need to learn to push off and use your glutes. And that's where I don't like walking on treadmills as much as I like walking on the ground because a treadmill is treading, turning under you and you're just trying to keep up. So you can just Flintstone your feet, right? The whole time. But if I go out into the world, if I just take a little Flintstone step, I'm really not gonna go anywhere. I have to propel myself forward. That's where the, um, 
uh, what are the tre the Woodway treadmills that are like they're belt they're belt less like they it's it's just a tread that you have to turn. I like those because that creates a true stride and you start to recruit your glutes and push your leg through rather than just like I got to hip flex hip flex hip flex and just keep up like a hamster on a wheel right. The Woodway treadmills also have a curve to them. We call them like a nickname, like a banana treadmill, because they're they have that curve, and so it, it's softer on ground contact with your feet as well. Uh, not many places have those, but good gyms do. So proper posture, learning how to do that, that's very good. And they talk about you know keeping your head in the center, staying tall, keeping your shoulders retracted and neutral into a good postured position, um, allowing your hips to move. Okay, trying not to roll too much side to side. Engage your core. You don't have to hollow out your belly and puff your chest up like Superman, but we do want you to be postured up and keep your core tight, you know, as you go. And then practicing that proper um, foot stride, heel through the toe, and you're striding through it about three foot lengths of your foot. If you overstride, you're going to take too long of a step. It's going to impact the heel and push you backwards. So every step, you're going to go forward, push back forward pushback. I'm exaggerating, obviously, but that's going to happen. You're going to basically break yourself every time you go. If you take too small of a step and then lean forward, basically you're just constantly falling into a forward position. There are running mechanics and strategies that encourage that, but we're not running. Okay. And I don't want you constantly in a state of being out of control where you're about to fall over. We want to have a good controlled stride. That's where three of your foot lengths is pretty much ideal. A very good way to practice this is get a second pair of shoes out, right? And put one of those shoes down and then stagger your feet. So one of your shoes fits in between the other two and you can go, oh, that's how long my stride needs to be. And if need be, do that seven or eight times and put a cone on each one of those and just see as you're walking, if you can get your heel to the in, in toe to the next cone, to the next cone, to the next cone. And then you can feel what it's like to take a little bit longer stride or the more appropriate stride, okay? So practice those. And I'm a huge fan of good proper footwear. I think you should only have a pair of shoes that you walk in. That's all you do in them. You don't walk around the house. You don't lift, definitely don't lift weights in them. You don't do yard work. You don't go out. You don't do anything other than these are my walking shoes. Okay. They're designed to go sagittal forward. Nowhere else walking shoes are. They're, they're good cushioned absorbing shoes and they will last you six months or so, depending on how much you walk, but on average six, six months. When you get your shoe right on the arch or the instep of the shoe, write the date, you know, June 1998 or whenever you got them, right? Uh, and then why, why that year? I don't know. June 1998. And then, you know, you can go from there. Okay, I've got six months uh, at least until I'm going to need to replace these shoes. And you can keep track of them because you won't, a lot of times you don't remember when you got your shoes. I get a new pair in January and a new pair in July every year. Uh, that started like three or four years ago when one of my clients bought me a really nice pair of rucking boots. And I just said, hey, <clears throat> every six months I got to get a new one. And they've continued to kind of do that every Christmas. Very cool. Okay. So footwear is super important. Losing weight. Great, great idea. If you're lighter, if your body weight is lighter, it's going to be less impact on your uh, ground strikes, less pressure down on your spine when you walk. I think that's great. Overall, uh, that's going to give you great benefits across the board. Get better footwear, as we talked about. Again, have only one dedicated pair of shoes that goes just to walking. You should also have a dedicated pair of shoes that you only lift weights in. When you're lifting weights, you're flattening and packing your shoes. If you then go and walk on those shoes, you're not going to have the cushion that you want. Okay, so don't have an active pair of shoes and then like social shoes. You want to have an active walking pair, an active lifting pair. If you were going to go golfing, you wouldn't wear like your spikes anywhere else other than on the golf course, right? If you had um, cleats for baseball, you would only wear those on the, like, it's the same thing. These are my only walking shoes, okay? Hopefully I'm making a good point there. Regular exercise, resistance training, anything else, physical therapy, if you have limitations or injuries, all very important across the board. And then your hot and cold therapies, I think these are great. One really good thing to think about, I think that's my last set. Oh, I got one more. <clears throat> is if you have injured muscles, putting heat on them sometimes doesn't help. Okay. There's not a lot of research that I'm aware of that shows heat on an injured muscle will make it better. Heat on tight muscles, different story. If you just wake up and you're like, my back's tight, my shoulders are tight, then heat can help bring blood flow to that area and help you loosen up. Okay. That's why you feel so loose after hot yoga. That's why you feel loose getting out of the hot tub because your muscles have been warmed to where they are more elastic. Does it mean you're more pliable? No. Really good research. Dean Somerset up in Canada has great research that looks at like 
static stretching, ballistic stretching, uh, stretching under extreme temperatures, hot or cold, this and that. What actually makes you more flexible? None of them. They all are designed to help loosen your body up. What makes you more flexible is moving load through a greater range of motion. So you do all these dynamic mobilities to help loosen your body up, and then you lift weights and under a, a certain amount of load, a decent amount of load, working through deeper ranges of motion, actually elongate and stretch your muscles. That's why bodybuilders were actually pretty flexible. Like watch videos, I always reference this, um, Arnold and Franco doing squats, and they are the two biggest, bulkiest guys in the room. And they're the only ones that can squat and touch their butt to their ankles and come back up with their heels together like this, right? And they're not tucking their butt, zero butt wink. I mean, they're super flexible, but when they walk around, they look just stiff as a board because they're always flexing, right? They're designed to look that way, but because they move load through big ranges to stretch their muscles, make them big, they were actually very flexible, okay? So I know that's a very old school reference, but it goes all the way back to these old practices. So <clears throat> you gotta play with this a little bit. Some people feel great after cold plunges. There's very good research. We just started cold plunging again. I did a ton of that through college. We would cold plunge at the end of every single workout, every single day of training. We had 10 ice baths that were all laid out and between football, track and field, everybody that shared our end of the stadium, we all got in there for five to 10 minutes a day. You know, I'd go up to my neck, my hands and my face were the only thing out. And we would do that every day, three, five days a week, something like that. Um, and then, you know, uh, warm therapies like saunas, uh, uh, red lights, that kind of thing, floating techniques, all those things. You got to find what works well for you. There's a lot of different options out there. So <clears throat> that kind of wraps up a little bit of the idea. If, if generally speaking, you don't have anything majorly wrong with you, like a ruptured disc or a torn muscle, these are some strategies that should help. Okay. Think about these as you go through. Also know, like if you do have sciatic pain, nothing's relieving it, then you should probably follow up with your doc and get some more information on that, an x-ray, an MRI, physical therapy, et cetera, and try to figure out what the deal is because we don't wish that on anyone. I know that pain well, and I don't wish it on anybody. Any comments, questions, hit me up down below. If not, please uh, continue to fight your good fight against sarcopenia, and I will see you in the next one. I hope you joined it. Please subscribe, hit the like button, ring the bell, make sure you get all the information we put out weekly, at least one video, if not more. We love and appreciate, appreciate you all. And until next time, take care. Peace.